And this is something that's not going to happen in, uh, in brick and mortar, right? You're not going to have someone shout at you, hey, you cannot take this to the fitting room, you've got to pay for it first, right? This is not going to happen and you wouldn't be doing it. Natalia, thanks for inviting us, actually. It's really great to be here. Um, yeah, and I'm with Zalando, actually, Zalando Payments, to be specific. Uh, and uh, we are also acting as a marketplace, in fact. Uh, and I'm going to talk a bit about uh, the PSD2 regulation that I assume many of you are aware of. But not only from a regulatory aspect, but also how we actually uh, turned this into, into a useful product that actually uh, customers love. So <clears throat> let's, let's take a quick look at Zalando. Some numbers first, actually. Uh, and uh, this one is, a, this is the biggest number. This one is the, uh, is the smallest. Uh, but it's, I think, the most interesting one because uh, operating in 17 countries also means that you have to have a lot of payment methods. And uh, connecting to the previous talk, actually, uh, yeah, I think it does make total sense to, uh, to be active in many markets, many countries. I think this is really important, but this also means that, of course, you have to specialize to those markets, right? So, and all these markets function very differently. So, probably in Germany, you know, many people use invoice, uh, bank transfer, stuff like this, which no one ever does in France or other countries where people have credit cards, which is not the case uh, in Germany. You said there are countries where, where people use cash on delivery, for instance, right? So Italy or so. Um, and there are payment methods that are only available in, in specific countries. So you have to adapt to this. I think this is, this is, this is very important. So then we have lots of brands, 2,000 brands that, that make up 450,000 articles and sell them to lots of, lots of visitors, actually. And this all sums up to quite some large number then compared to the 17 at least, like 6.6 uh, 6 billion euros of, of, of GMV. And all of this has to go through, of course, the payment systems that we're building. Uh, and the important aspect, and we will come back to this later, is that we have a share of 60% deferred uh, payment uh, options. And so let's look, let's look at why this could be important. So what, what, what is special about paying for fashion online. What do you think is special in, pay in, in fashion? Returns, right? Returns, why is that? Why? Yeah. Because not everything fits. Exactly. Yeah, not immediately. And how does this relate to payments? It's pretty clear, right? You probably don't want to take payment until you know the sale is done and dusted. Exactly, right? So let's look My at... My wife is a very, very good customer of yours. That's how I know the shit. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, but this is exactly the point, right? So let's look at how this would be in brick and mortar uh, retail, right? So fashion, you would take the stuff that you have to the, to the fitting room, try it on, right? If you want to have a pair of shoes, probably you take, take multiple at the same time or also other piece, pieces and see which one fits, right? And, and this is something that's not going to happen in, uh, in brick and mortar, right? You're not going to have someone shout at you, hey, you cannot take this to the fitting room, you've got to pay for it first, right? This is not going to happen and you wouldn't be doing it. Um, so why on earth do we do this in online, right? If you do the same in, in online retail, you want a pair of shoes, there's no way you can know whether it fits. I don't know. Do you know your shoe size? Probably you do, but is it ever correct? It's a whole different problem of its own. But typically what you want to do is you take the size that you think is right. You take one size smaller, one size larger. Uh, and then you try it on, right? And if you start with 70 euros, you end up with a 210 euro bill and that's totally pointless. Why would you want to pay this? And this is, this is a problem that we have to solve, right? Um, because otherwise we have really, really bad customer experience. So this is relatively easily solv solvable in, in markets such as Germany, where people use invoice, right? Um, at least if you trust these customers or if you believe that you will ever get the money from them. You can send them the goods, uh, give them an invoice and wait for them to pay. And they can also do this after trying things on, right? You wait for the stuff to be delivered, try it on, pay for your bill, uh, and there you go. Um, 
this is a totally different thing if people aren't used to bank transfer, and there are many countries where this is the case. There are countries where people just think this is this is too this is not a good user experience. Why it's too bothersome to go to a banking portal and and type in everything manually. This is just just not not going to happen. People aren't used to it. It has not been the case that this is a traditionally used payment method there. And credit cards are much more popular than in Germany. And there we have built a product that we refer to as Pay Later. Um, and this is based on credit cards. Um, people do have to enter their credit card number uh, during checkout, in fact. But we don't authorize the amount yet at the point of, uh, point of checkout. All we do is we do a va zero value pre auth If that is known to you, it doesn't really matter. Basically, what we're doing is we validate that the card actually exists. And we, we charge people only later. We do this upon return, right? This is exactly the, the point in time where you would expect it, actually, when you've chosen, decided what you keep. Uh, exactly. So um, both of these methods, of course, come with higher risk for the merchant or for the platform. Because it might be that you never ever see the money, right? You may have to send dunnings to customers afterwards. Uh, people just don't pay. Even in this case, it might be that for some reason the credit card is no longer available or there have never been enough funds on the card or whatever. So this is risky. So this is a trade-off, obviously, and it's pretty well illustrated by, by this chart why this is still, still a pretty cool thing to do. Because this shows that the more you offer uh, these kinds of deferred payment methods uh, to customers, the more likely they are to convert. That is, the more likely they are to com complete the checkout. These numbers are made up. Actually, there's uh, not even numbers on the x-axis and the, the one on the y-axis are meaningless. So this is just uh, symbolic, right? But, but you get the point. The more you offer this, right, the, mo the more options there are for your customers to pay with the deferred payment methods, the, li the more likely they are to convert. Um, of course, now all the, the trick is in actually offering this to those customers where you're actually likely to get the money in the end, right? That's, of course, then where the, where the uh, risk scoring uh, kicks in. And the beautiful part is that you can really tweak this, right? If your sc risk scoring model gives you confidence, you can still uh, move the threshold up to which confidence uh, do you actually offer uh, a deferred payment method, right? And you can perfectly steer this, and you already know if I raise this, I will get higher conversion. And this is super convenient to the merchant because they can trade uh, the risk and the, the risk of credit default against customer convenience and conversion. So you can, this, is, this is a very good means to steer the business, actually. Um, coming, to, uh, coming to this, just as an aside, um, we are, as Zalando, also operating uh, in a marketplace model, right? I think there was some number missing in the first slide. That is the number of partners, actually. Um, so there are, we have a partner business where, where partners are st selling stuff on the platform, right? And we are doing all of this now in, in a factoring model, right? Which makes it even more convenient for the merchant. Basically, uh, it's, up to, uh, it's up to us to decide whether we want to offer this, this deferred payment, but once it's decided, if the order is placed, we immediately buy the receivable. Uh, and then it's our business to actually make sure that we get the money. Uh, which is exactly also one of the things that, that, that you said before, there wouldn't be multiple bills to a merchant or something. It's like we, ju we just buy the receivable, that's it, and it's super convenient for the merchant, and at the same time they can steer this customer experience. Good. So now comes PSD2, right? And I guess, who of you knows PSD2? I guess most of you, right? Or who doesn't know it? Okay, that's so then the rest of you can explain what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, part of it, right? So, so actually this is the regulation that came into effect actually September 14th. Uh, and it's a set of rules, the goal of which is actually to protect customers when they pay online and also to promote more innovative online and mobile payment methods like open banking and overall to make it just safer. Um, and what does this mean? So the, the important parts there are protect customers and make it safer. And, and, and this is done by enforcing strong customer authentication, actually. Um, 
strong customer authentication means you cannot just buy something. You need to say you need to be really sure that we know that this is your card, right? Which is typically not the case when you have a credit card, for instance. If you just have it, you take a photo of it, or you have the physical card, you steal it from someone, or you're just able to memorize 16 digits, then you can just pay with it, right? That's not cool. The regulation actually enforces that when we collect the money, the customer must, must actually authenticate uh, themselves so this money can be authorized. Um, Okay, then maybe it's, this is interesting then. So if, if this is not known, then we can maybe quickly ask this question. Why is it actually important, or why is it good for the customer if they enter their password or their PIN or whatever of the credit card? Why is that good for the customer at this moment in time? Does it make it safer for you if you enter your password? That's not the moment in time that it makes it safe for you, right? That's the moment in time where it makes it inconvenient for you. The moment in time that makes it safe for you if, is if someone else uh, tries to buy with your credit card, right? That's the moment in time that makes it safe for you. Someone who steals it does not have the password. The fact that you enter it doesn't make it any safer, right? It feels safer to the customer, right? There's some password thingy, this must be safe. But the actual safety comes from, from the fraudster <laughs> not knowing the password. And on the other hand, if this is not mandatory, it's not safe at all because the fraudster can just go to a bank that doesn't ask for the password, right? So this is actually a bit, at this point of time, a bit of an illusion for the customer that this is the thing that creates safety. Real safety comes from really enforcing it. And what makes this, however, relevant to the, to the merchant is the liability shift that comes with it. So once you have entered your, your, your credentials or whatever for a credit card, then you complete the so-called 3DS flow, then the liability uh, shifts, right? And you can no longer say, it wasn't me, someone else stole it, right? So it's actually an advantage for the merchant. It's not an advantage for the customer, at this, if it's a <coughs> legitimate customer, at least. So um, let's see. Let's start with must-haves. We already talked about 3DS, right? This is this flow. This is uh, the, the strong customer authentication, so to say, in the scope of credit cards, or at least this authentication at all in the scope of credit cards. And version two makes it strong, actually. And that is, so to say, the 3DS way of implementing this new regulation, PSD2. I never said what it means. It means Payment Services Directive, version two. Uh, and yeah, we just talked about it. It doesn't, not only does it make it safer, it also requires more user interaction. It's, more, it's less convenient, actually, and it means there is a reduced conversion rate during the checkout, actually. People will not necessarily complete this. Because I don't know, who, of you, do, who has a credit card? And, and who of you knows the PIN? Wow. <laughs> wow, that's still a lot. I don't know my PIN, to be very honest. So. <laughs> Yeah, it's a fintech meetup, right? But, but but very many people don't know their PIN, so they wouldn't even be able to complete. And you really see this that lots of people drop out there, up to fifty percent or so. And the promise of version two is that this will be much more frictionless and and significantly reduce the failure rate. So this is when we started, right? Uh, we started back in two thousand seventeen to start thinking about this. Uh, and then we had like two years time or something until the deadline would kick in and this would become mandatory. And within this time, we somehow had to, to, to remove all this negative impact on the consumers that we were expecting and of course, consequently also on the business. Uh, so, what does it mean? What does it affect? For credit card transactions, the immediate payments, that's pretty clear, right? When you check out, okay, this may drop conversion. Then there's the deferred payments pay later that I just talked about. And this really doesn't go well with it because I just explained it enforces the authentication when you collect the money, right? When you capture the money. And for pay later, we capture the money when the goods arrive back at the warehouse. So there's no way to do this, right? At least in the basic version. In the basic version, this would be something that is incompliant. So we need to find a way for this actually to replace this because it's actually uh, not really compliant anymore in the way it was. There's also membership fees that are billed yearly. They have the same problem. Then no one is sitting in front of the screen, so they, there's no way for them to enter a password. 
So these are all our problems, and there are also problems of other people like PayPal and online ba bank transfer solutions. They all have the same problems, but this is for them to solve. So, okay, this I already said, but uh, it's again here in text form. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't have to repeat this now. Uh, so let's see what we did. Uh, we were, I think, pretty soon actually, so we started a r relatively reasonably big project for this and already in May 2019 we were basically ready to run this as an A-B test. So there was still lots of time to come. We were working with issuers and the schemes and acquirers and our 3DS provider to actually test this, right? We wanted to see who's actually ready for this and it was not so easy to even get a card that is actually enrolled for 3DS version 2. It was really tough. And everybody was really looking forward and we were talking to all of them and everybody was super excited when we made one success and get, got one part of the operation completed. It was really amazing. So this A-B test was live and we were checking who does actually support it and here you can see it. Right, these are the calendar weeks and this is the ratio of banks where we get some reasonable response uh, from the issuer. There is a positive trend, but it's not quite enough for this to become meaningful, right? So it's, the, it's extremely low. Um, so yeah, we observed this for some more time, what was going on. In July there was the first talk about the grace period maybe in France. Then there was a survey, uh, various surveys made by, by the EBA and in the UK subsequently. There was more talks about grace periods. MasterCard started to, to, to announce one. And in various other countries like Italy, uh, Nether the Netherlands, in the UK, in Austria, in Poland, Norway, Germany, Finland, Belgium, and in Luxembourg, they all announced the grace period in, in the end. And then so did the three, rema three remaining countries like uh, Sweden and Denmark and Spain. And yeah, OK. This was kind of expected when you see the readiness, right? No one, this was a fancy new regulation, but no one was actually implementing it. And it was really, you were celebrating each, each success, but it really wasn't taking off. So we also had some, started to implement some fallback logic where we would behave reasonably also after the date of the regulation uh, when the car would not support or we would try the most or the best approach first, and by best we mean credit card without 3DS, we would just try to authorize. If we fail, we would see does it work with 3DS or 3DS2. Um, so then we, <coughs> the date came, right? The compliance kicked in on September 14th. And then we enabled this and we saw what we expected. This would actually, no one was still ready and this would significantly, at least a few percentage points, impact the conversion rate, which is exactly yeah, uh, what it promised not to do. But the effect was there, right? So it's live, it's good. I think I feel we're ready. We, we have a pretty reasonable uh, implementation. But this was only for the must saves. I was promising you to, to, to talk about how we actually turn this into a cool product in the end. So let's recap. What was the original problem? Uh, because what we haven't solved yet is the pay later part, right? Uh, we don't want to pay for, for just trying things on, right? We want to try things on, and once we, we decide what we keep, we want to pay for it. But this is not compatible with PSD2 because it demands the customer to be on site when we actually collect the money. <coughs> so we need to solve these two problems. First, we need to, to solve the problem that the customer must get back to their screen at some point of time, and we need to find the right point in time uh, in the shopping experience or in the, in, the, in the user journey, where it's actually a natural point in time to actually pay. So this is the natural one, right? We actually like to pay just after you decided what you want to keep. It's what you said, this is the same as in, as in brick and mortar, right? Uh, you go to the fitting room, uh, this is what you, what, you want to what you want to keep, you're a bit of you're excited, probably you're looking forward to, to getting these things. And at this point of time, you're naturally also willing to pay. And the equivalent of this in online return is, uh, is uh, sorry, in online retail is, is, is during the return, right? When you, when you decide the return is actually, at least if you think about returning things in terms of deciding what you keep and not what you don't keep, then this is the point in time where you actually decide it and where you're willing to pay. So we must find a way to integrate this with this online return. 
And that's what we did. So first of all, we talked to a couple of users uh, in all the different markets, because I said this is, this is, this is very different from, from, from country to country. Some people do know invoice, some don't, some have credit cards, some don't. And we got some quite amazing uh, responses from them. Here are three quotes. Therefore, it's a German one. This is like invoice, but I can pay with a payment method of my choice. Yeah, exactly. You don't pay when you check out, you pay later, and then you can do however you want. You can still pay with bank transfer uh, or with credit card or PayPal, or whatever. So this person got it. Others think, ah, it's nice. Uh, so I don't use my own money just to try things on. So people exactly got wh why we were designing this, and it seemed to fit, fit their exact needs. But there are also some who didn't quite trust it. I, I, this I find really uh, impressive. Like, you're sending me goods without me paying anything? This can't be right. You must be tricking me, right? So this, there's some, some fraud going on or whatever. I don't trust this. Which is funny, right? We are trusting them, but in return, they don't trust us. Hmm. This is surprising, <laughs> right? It shows why user research is good. It's not funny anywhere outside Germany, by the way. It's what? It's not funny anywhere outside Germany. Funny? It's not, yeah, that's, it's anywhere in Europe outside Germany, is, that's, that's what people think. Yeah, yeah, you think so? Anywhere outside the Germany? The was already, the was like, this is a scam. <laughs> yeah, that's what people thought, in fact. So this means uh, security and trust are really essential, right? We need to build this. So we did actually this in three phases now. Um, it was clear that we have to build something where you can pay outside the regular checkout experience, right? And then there was also the complicated thing like in integrating this with the returns flow, but let's do things one at a time. Just let's just decouple the payment step first and let's just do it with the customers that owe us money anyways. So those who are already in Dunning, right? Those customers where we send uh, an email with, with a Dunning, we include a link where people can click on, actually come to a payments page, um, and then pay, right? That's not so super exciting, but it was already testing the experience that we're building for, for this deferred checkout. That was the first step, and the second one was actually to integrate this only with the returns flow. Uh, so we tried this with some, some treatment group in the countries where this pay later product was live as a replacement for this and see how does it perform in, in comparison to that. Um, do people accept it? Uh, do they understand it? Uh, what does it do to the conversion, ra conversion rate? Uh, stuff like this. That was the next step, and then we extended this even more um, uh, with more payment methods also into and, and, and could now uh, integrate this in other countries as well, uh, comparing this with, uh, with, the, with the invoice product, for instance, because there's a trade-off again, bec invoice kind of is the same, but it's of course also more expensive if now people buy this product, switch to PayPal, because then we have to pay all the PayPal fees, right? So these are all things to consider, and we did this in phases. Um, this is right now, is, this, is, uh, yeah, this is already launched um, in these, these PayPal, uh, pay later markets actually. But it was a huge, huge uh, uh, number of teams involved, right? All the payments teams on the checkout side and the processing side, the checkout of the, of the platform itself, the order team, the returns team, uh, everything needs to work with accounting, uh, customer contacts, because mails need to be sent. It needs to be integrated with the accounts page and the order details and everything. So this was a huge thing, actually. Um, and really a great experience to collaborate with so many teams because everybody was working, working towards this. Really great collaboration. Um, one of the major proje projects that we had in the last half year, the last full year actually. So let's look what we built actually. No, this is no longer working, it is. So uh, this is a new checkout actually where we actually uh, having this new option at the very top um, where we're trying to explain how this actually works, right? There's a bit more text than for the other ones. We're trying to make it visual, explain, uh, try to build the, the trust that this is actually <laughs> not a scam, as you just said, right? Uh, explain this to the customer. You can click on learn more even to understand it and give it a reasonable name, right? Try first, pay later. So, and once the customer selects this, there is nothing more in the checkout, right? No, no credit cards to, to, uh, to enter yet or anything. And then this happens, you get a parcel, right? 
so this is this is then uh, yeah uh, the moment in time where things arrive. There's an exciting time in the user journey, right, where people yeah actually are excited about the the stuff they just got shipped. Uh, in this, so to say, an emotional peak within the customer journey, and this is the point in time where people are actually willing again to pay. Uh, so they try these things on and then they go back obviously to, to their app because now they decide what they keep, what they return and then you get the overview uh, of the stuff that you got, just got. Right? This is a regular overview that has always been there but it says now there's still, there's still an amount open for it right? and now you can pay it. right? You can do it at any point in time but this is, this is the most natural one and we pull people on this page by email, by push notifications, stuff like this. And then we hope to get the money, right? And we do so. But 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 this is this is basically this is basically the approach, and then you get a confirmation in the end. Um, uh, not a confirmation yet. Then then you get to the regular checkout or something that looks like the regular checkout, where you set, select an actual payment method, like like credit card or PayPal, or in this case also Super Direct Debit. Uh, in this uh, prototype here. I think this is not exactly how it looks like uh, in, in, in real life. Um, this is pretty standard, well known again, something that people know already, um, and then it's done, right? <coughs> and then you get a confirmation and are happy that you just purchased something as if you would have purchased it in a brick and mortar store. So, this is actually uh, in the end how this not only was a solution to a regulatory uh, directive, but also something that's useful in other markets as well, like in invoice markets where this wouldn't even be a problem. And I think a good lesson to, to, um, yeah, to approach compliance projects. Some people already, uh, tend to say, ah, this is a compliance project again, but actually you can build cool products with it. You have it almost two months that is ready in your website, or it is more than that? Because you said it from the September 2019. That that's when the compli when the regulation kicked in. Okay. Uh, so you had it before then, okay? Yeah, we had it before, yeah. Okay. So do you have any statistics that how many percent of your user select that and how many does not pay after the four 14? Yes, I have the statistic, and I won't share it. <laughs> 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 I think we can't do that actually, sorry, uh, but uh, yeah, that's, I, th I think we have to leave it at this. Even but but I actually... Question. I would like to know how many percent that they don't pay. I, uh, I want to know if I have, a, for example, a customer or something, to how many percent I can suggest this kind of services to my customer, to yeah. have it in the yeah. I mean, that obviously depends on... I mean, this depends on obviously uh, on, the on the yeah on the market and on your customers. Obviously, we have basically the Lando Fashion Store as the customer, right? And there we have tuned this very well, right? As I said in the beginning, uh, this offering rate is of course tuned to not only maximize the conversion rate but also minimize the the, the credit default, right? And that's exactly our. Um, our business model, that's what we're good in. We're good in tweaking this so that in order to minimize actually uh, this, this ratio of the credit default and we can offer it to quite, uh, to, to most customers, yeah, to more than most, <laughs> to, to a lot. So this is, this is actually pretty cool, but the exact numbers I think we unfortunately cannot share. I think you were first. This is by the way my last slide, so yeah. <laughs> 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 no, but go ahead, go ahead with it. <laughs>